what is the meaning of waste it's an adjective and we use it to talk about things which we do not need anymore things that we have gotten ourselves rid of whatever we use we do not call it waste but isn't there uh, a number of things of great value which we do not use anymore do we call them waste what about the stories we do not listen to anymore what about the myths we do not understand what we now know as the last remaining signature of human civilization is built on these stories and i had promised you in the very first part of this series that i'm going to tell you a lot of stories stories that eliot would have wanted us to know so i'll begin today's class with one such story so that we understand the second part of eliot's poem the wasteland which is called the story i was talking to you about is of philomela this story is found in ovid's metamorphoses many of you have heard about that book i'm sure the story goes like this there was this beautiful girl called philomela and her sister's name was procne she is kidnapped and then raped by her own brother-in-law king tereus tereus did not want his wife to know about all this so he cut philomela's tongue so that she couldn't speak she was put in a prison but she found out a way to reveal what had happened to her she wove a kind of an embroidery a tapestry where she expressed what had happened with her after her sister came to know about the whole incident she frees philomela and they plot a revenge against king tereus and that revenge was so much against procne herself they killed the king's son and actually fed him to the king when the king came to know about it he was so so mad he wanted to punish them but before he could reach them they turned into birds and escaped this story of philomel is going to be very very important if we are to understand the second part of eliot's poem and when we reach this allusion in our reading of the poem then i can tell you how the theme of philomel story is linked to the narration of wasteland so let's begin the game of chess the chair she sat in like a burnished throne glowed on the marble where the glass held up by standards wrought with fruited vines from which a golden cupidon peeped out another hid his eyes behind his wing doubled the flames of seven branched candelabra reflecting light upon the table as the glitter of her jewels rose to meet it what kind of a beginning is this this is very much shakespearean marlovian beginning because this is very much in blank verse unrhymed iambic pentameter the golden meter that the greatest dramatists of the elizabethan age used in their plays whenever something grand is planned something like paradise lost this verse comes to the mind of the poets so blank verse gives a kind of a grandeur which eliot is trying to replicate here so before we go into the meanings of the first few lines of this part we already have a feeling that this is something uh, grand something of a replication of something shakespearean and we are looking forward to something very great which is about to happen things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme right as milton says in paradise lost but what is this actually about the chair she sat in so this is about a woman who is sitting on a chair and the chair is like a burnished throne so this woman who is sitting on this chair uh, is like a queen and then he goes on to describe the entire scene and we get to understand that this is a luxurious dining room or drawing room or parlor of some sort of a rich person's house so let's read through them the chair 
she sat in like a burnished throne glowed on the marble where the glass held up by standards wrought with fruited vines from which a golden cupidon peeped out so think about the descriptions here there is marble on the floor and he mentions glass and he mentions fruited vines so it's very well decorated and he mentions a couple of cupidons that is cute little representations of the cupid figure and there is the seven branched candelabra so it's an elaborate description of an elaborately decorated luxurious room so somebody is sitting there that's the main point here now this whole description is very much similar to shakespeare's tragedy antony and cleopatra where uh, enobarbus describes cleopatra's royal barge uh, as it appeared when she first uh, went after mark antony pursued mark antony so the beginning is definitely shakespearean now he goes on from satin cases poured in rich profusion in vials of ivory and colored glass unstoppered lurked her strange synthetic perfumes unguent powdered or liquid troubled confused and drowned the sense in odors stirred by the air that freshened from the window these ascended in fattening the prolonged candle flames flung their smoke into the lacaria stirring the pattern on the coffered ceiling this is definitely about some kind of perfume evaporating from unstoppered colored glass vials very much like belinda's dressing table only here we have words like synthetic the word synthetic specifically is something artificial so this room is fragrant but with an overpowering synthetic perfume which is not natural and these words troubled confused and drowned the sense in odors is not a very flattering thing it means that somebody who is in that room is not feeling very natural about the perfume around that person so an atmosphere is created which is again uh, quite linked to aenid in aenid there was this feast hall uh, in which uh, aeneas recounts his story Uh, about the fall of troy and the uh, voyage of the exiled trojans to his carthaginian host so when he was describing this whole thing the hall is described in rich details and iliad follows that entire cult of describing the hall and somehow this grandeur of aenid uh, that is satirized in the way a modern day drawing room is described because that is what this is actually about it's just a rich man's drawing room and somehow when this word is used drown the sense in odors i personally connected to that expression in keats's to autumn drowsed with the fumes of poppies and that is about autumn this is about spring so this change in the way expressions are used in poetry while keats was using that in a natural context eliot is using a uh, very similar expressions to talk about a very artificial synthetic environment and look at this expression that these uh, perfumes which were basically um, oily substances they made the candles burn even brighter so they fattened the prolonged candle flames and these expressions lacaria it means paneled ceiling a coffered ceiling that is also kind of panels in the shape of rectangles or squares is a very common in uh, modern architecture or interior designing and then he talks about huge sea wood fed with copper burned green and orange framed by the colored stone the verse is still grand and the way he is presenting this whole uh, scene uh, is majestic no doubt although it's a synthetic scene it's an artificial environment that he is describing but he is describing it in a majestic way so when these herbs these were burned 
there were these smokes coming out and he relates this image to that of a dolphin in which satellite a carved dolphin swam now we don't know if there was actually a carved dolphin anywhere or the whole room becomes like a sad dolphin swimming about above the antique mantel that is opening of the fireplace which is very decorated also was displayed as though a window gave upon the sylvan scene this expression sylvan scene this is again from paradise lost so iliad borrows from milton at random right so there was this fireplace and just above the fireplace there was this tapestry there was this painting or embroidery we are not given exact details about that we are just told that there was uh, a frame which was like a window through which we could see as if a sylvan scene a very fertile unwaste land scene that is sylvan scene and what was that painting about it was about the change of philomel now you already know what that means don't you by the barbarous king the savage king the rude king so rudely forced yet there the nightingale filled all the desert with inviolable voice the voice was inviolable which means it could not be destroyed becoming the nightingale philomel tried to tell the whole world about her story but when the world becomes deaf it doesn't understand these stories it doesn't understand the meaning of the song of the nightingale and then that song becomes just a dirty sound in their ears yet there the nightingale filled all the desert with inviolable voice and still she cried and still the world pursues jug jug to dirty ears who has dirty ears insensitive people we are insensitive people because we belong to the modern world we belong to the post modern world so no matter how much philomel cries as a nightingale we will never be able to figure out her misery her sadness her tragedy because we have stopped reading ovid we have stopped reading the stories of our past this is what iliad is trying to tell us now look at it from a different perspective this poem which iliad is trying to write which he probably imagines to be the only mythology created in the modern times does he have this feeling working in his mind that all these mythologies have lost their grandeur their value their relevance what will happen to my poetry will my poetry also become jug jug to dirty years now that depends how much effort we are ready to give how much time we are ready to invest in the wasteland to make it worthwhile so i have told this in the previous video also that iliad is the tiresias here he is giving us these glimpses from the past and while doing so he is also being personal although he would really hate me to say this because impersonality is like his keyword when he creates anyway what other things were there in that drawing room and other withered stumps of time philomel stung like a stump of time uh, there were other mythologies painted upon the walls in frames and he doesn't mention them staring forms leaned out as if those frames or uh, those paintings the the characters in those paintings were leaning out of the room reminds me of the portraits in harry potter who always communicate here these stories are trying to communicate with the people who are there in the room but are those people capable of understanding them capable of registering their attempt to communicate let's see leaned out leaning hushing the room enclosed 
footsteps shuffled on the stairs so somebody is coming under the firelight under the brush her hair spread out in fiery points so we are again uh, prepared for something grand that is about to be spoken by this woman uh, we have encountered women in uh, part 1 women like madam sosostris who had a bad cold so we are anticipating some grandeur but we are also apprehensive that this is eliot so let's see what is this about so this woman sitting uh, she has her head spread out in fiery points glowed into words then would be savagely still so her hair is quite expressive how much expressive this woman is my nerves are bad tonight yes bad stay with me the structured iambic pentameter breaking down so the waterfall begins speak to me why do you never speak speak what are you thinking of what thinking what i never know what you are thinking think somebody is desperately trying to communicate with another person and that other person is quite silent up to this point so there is a woman who's trying to talk to probably a man and the man responds like this I think we are in rats alley where the dead men lost their bones sharply in contrast with the frenzied expressions of the woman this man is being very philosophical very melancholic and quite vague this woman is actually telling something that you don't speak to me i don't understand what you're thinking so there is an urgency in her she wants to communicate and this man is absolutely shutting himself up and saying we are in rats alley what is rats alley well after uh, the trench warfare in world war this expression rats alley was frequently in uh, used in connection with the trenches that soldiers had to uh, dig and hide themselves in and often they died there so he says where the dead men lost their bones so this whole thing is like memory of the trench warfare in the world war what is that noise suddenly the woman hears something the wind under the door what is that noise now what is the wind doing so both of them are talking right one statement is by the woman and the other statement is by the man and this expression what is that noise the wind under the door this is again from the devil's law case there is this play by john webster which acts as a context as per eliot's notes what is that noise now what is the wind doing so the frenzied expressions are by the woman and the serious replies are by the man okay so you have to imagine the whole thing nothing again nothing do you know nothing do you see nothing do you remember nothing so she is still trying to understand him i remember those are pearls that were his eyes are you alive or not is there nothing in your head now what is interesting is the use of quotation marks by eliot here normally we would think that this woman is saying something and a man is replying but then whatever the woman is saying is within inverted comma right what is that noise uh, i never know what you're thinking think but whenever this man is replying there is no quotation mark right so we just assume that this is replied by the man but i feel that these are not even spoken out this man is not talking to her because if he actually spoke out loud and said i think we are in rats alley she would ask what rats alley what do you mean by rats alley we are rats do you want to say that but no she doesn't reply to his comment ever so whenever there is this expression or set of words which are not within quotation marks we might assume that the person she is speaking to is actually being silent and this is the problem communication has completely broken down 
he doesn't know how to communicate to her she just like the paintings all around her she is leaning on to him to tell him something to know about him but is unable to do everything is jug jug to dirty years so when this expression comes up i remember those are pearls that were his eyes we are very unsure who is actually thinking this because clearly nobody is saying this is it tiresias is this scene making him remember something and why does he use this expression where have we heard this expression if you have read the tempest you would remember that when ariel was describing ferdinand's father uh, to ferdinand that your father has drowned he used this expression it goes like this full fathom five thy father lies of his bones are coral made those are pearls that were his eyes and that one single line is picked up are you alive or not definitely this man is not talking this man is thinking maybe this man is tiresias who knows is there nothing in your head so this woman is very desperate to know now but oh 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 that shakespearean rag it's so elegant so intelligent suddenly this man is thinking about a 1912 hit shakespearean rag which was quite popular but this was nothing absolutely nothing in grandeur comparable to anything that the great master wrote so this breakdown of culture from that high season of renesa to shakespearean rag the decline the debasement of intellect the wasting away of intelligence so this man is thinking about suddenly out of context this shakespearean rag and the woman continues to say what shall i do now what shall i do i shall rush out as i am and walk the street with my hair down so uh, what shall we do tomorrow what shall we ever do clearly they have not been doing much together for long reminds me of a play written much later in which characters istragon and vladimir they simply have nothing to do they wait and in that waiting for go to process have you watched those videos we have made i hope you have in that waiting for go to duration they try to figure out what to do with their lives written much before that play this snippet of conversation becomes like an expression of vladimir and istragon's plight what shall i do now and this reply which comes again as a thought the hot water at 10 and if it rains a closed car at 4 so predictability of life nothing adventurous is going to happen and we shall play a game of chess ah there we have this must be very important this is the title of this entire part so they're planning to have a game of chess pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door what does this mean they will be playing a game of chess and therefore they would stay awake but why would they wait for a knock upon the door now there's this interesting trivia at the request of his wife vivian three lines in uh, a game of chess section were removed from the poem Uh, and we shall play a game of chess the ivory men make company between us pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door ivory men make company between us vivian didn't want elliot to print these lines so this expression means that there is first of all lack of communication second thing is that they don't have much to do with each other and the game of chess which he is thinking about is also not free from doubts and then suddenly the conversation shifts it's as if we are scrolling uh, instagram reels we get into the next reel because see in reels uh, we are not allowed to see more than 30 seconds or maximum 1 minute so why are you complaining 
we are used to reels, aren't we? So let's get on to the next one. So there we have a woman speaking in the next part. And we are not sure she is speaking to how many people, maybe two, three of her friends. They are definitely not sitting in any lavish drawing room. They are actually sitting in a bar. So it's a bar conversation. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said demobbed means demobilized from the army. When a troop after the war gets dismissed or demobilized, it's demobbed in popular vocabulary. So this woman is talking about her friend Lil or maybe Lily that her husband got uh, demobbed from the army. I said, I didn't mince my words. I said to her myself, hurry up please it's time. Suddenly the whole thing breaks down. She was telling something and then there is this all capital letters staring at us. So definitely this is something which she is not saying. This is an interruption. It's late now. The bar is about to close and the bartender or the waiter, he is asking them to hurry up so that he can close the bar. This was pretty standard in England. So all through her narration about Lil, we will have this refrain. Hurry up please, it's time. Punctuating her words, interrupting her words. All right. All through. Now, Albert's coming back. So, we are back to Lil's story. So, Lil's husband, Albert, he got released from the army after the war. So, after he came home, then this woman, who is Lil's friend, told Lil to be very careful because now her husband needs all her attention. And how did she say all this? Now Albert's coming back. Make yourself a bit smart. He'll want to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. He did. I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set. As if natural teeth should be replaced by artificial ones just to impress a man. Maybe Lil's uh, teeth are not that beautifully set. Does that mean you have to get rid of your natural teeth? He said, I swear, I can't bear to look at you. What kind of a friend this is? Lil's friend talking like this about Lil. And no more can't I, I said. And think of poor Albert. She is very sympathetic about Albert. So we are trying to guess something else here as well. He's been in the army four years. He wants a good time. So he was in the army. He was deprived of sex. He wants to have uh, as much of physical intimacy as he can when he has returned. And if you don't give it him, these others will, I said. So if you don't grant your husband a pleasurable time, then he will find pleasure elsewhere. And that made Lil feel that I think you might be responsible for my husband's change of interest and she actually says that oh is there she said something of that i said then i'll know who to thank she said so lil had actually accused this woman that if my husband goes astray i would know who is responsible you will be responsible because you have an eye on him i see and give me a straight look so this woman is talking about her friend Lil here. Hurry up please, it's time. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. That's not my problem that you can't attract your husband. So this is what this woman's perspective is. But if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. Don't tell me that I didn't inform you that this could happen. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique. At her only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. So Lil had to take some pills, some medication to bring it off to abort a child. 
She had had five already and nearly died of young George. You can't blame her. All she had been doing all her life is giving birth to children. And she had had enough. She had some abortive medication and that led to uh, a lot of reactions on her physical features perhaps and she looks old. So who is responsible for her lack of youth? She is not Sibyl. It's not like she has actually become old and shriveled. She is only 31. But this insensitivity of society of her own husband has turned her into a premature Sibyl. The chemist said it would be all right, but I have never been the same. So Lil was transformed during Ovid's days or in Ovid's imagination. Transformations were magical. You become birds, you became plants, you turn into stars and moons and whatnots. Here, you transform into your worse self because this is modern life. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What you get married for if you don't want children? Very patriarchal, isn't it? Hurry up, please, it's time. Well, that Sunday Albert was home. They had a hot gammon and they asked me to dinner to get the beauty of it hard. And just when we are getting very interested, okay, I think now she got engaged with Albert or something. And what would happen then? But the time is up. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. And it's getting more and more urgent. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. So now we know who she was talking to. She was talking to Bill, Lou, May. Good night. Tata. Good night. Good night. And just before the scene ends, we have one more statement here. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. This line, who is the speaker here? Definitely not that woman. The bartender? The manager of the bar? Tiresias? Was he listening to all this? All the while? Why not? He is there everywhere. That was promised to him. He would know everything. He would see everything. So when this woman says goodbye... Perhaps he responds. But look at the expression Ilya deliberately chooses. This expression is directly taken from Hamlet. These were the farewell words of Ophelia. She says, And so I thank you for your good counsel. Come, my coach. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Ophelia dies by water, doesn't she? Ophelia was also quite like the hyacinth girl because all she talked about was the flowers, different kinds of flowers during the last phase of her life. But where is the game of chess? Nowhere. A betrayal of anticipation. But when you think about the two scenes created, One luxurious drawing room and one ordinary bar. They are like two extremes of this society. Like opposing set of chess pieces. Or uh, even within uh, the same color, you would notice that there are figures like the king, the queen, the knight. And there are figures like the pawns. So... No matter if you are a pawn or a queen, you end up on that same chess board, the chess board of modern life. Iliad actually was quite interested in chess. He used to play uh, this transatlantic chess through letters. You know, he would send one move, write it down and send it to his father. His father would respond with a response move. It was a long distant game. And that was the way he communicated with his father till his death in 1919. He used to play chess with his wife too when they couldn't communicate anymore. So a game of chess. Could it be uh, 
a kind of a hint that this is about communication because this part is all about how communication has broken down how it has become one sided in the first case we had one woman trying to communicate she is speaking and the responder is practically quiet because whatever is written there which we first thought he was speaking out was actually going on in his mind so failure of communication even in this second part where this woman is talking about lil the people she is talking to they are not responding they are only silent listeners it's like Browning's monologue after Browning's monologue after Browning's monologue is happening in not so clearly defined situations, and still we believe that we can understand the main problem here. The problem is no one is able to understand what's happening inside the mind of another. Now, in this part, we mostly see women talking, and in a game of chess, we know. that the most powerful the most versatile piece is the queen and not the king the king has to be castled in the king has to be protected the king has limited range of movement the king is mostly protected by the queen which kings are mentioned here in this part the rapist tyrius there is a vague reference to Ferdinand's father, who actually usurped his own brother, so the kings mentioned here or referred here, they are not at all positive images of royalty. And when we talk about king and the wasteland, we will have to talk about the Fisher King, the Fisher King who is wasting away, who is dying, and who needs to be revived. So it's going to be a game of chess. We will have to protect our king, our king. or the idea of kingship that is wasting away the idea of royalty of everything that has value in this world is wasting away there were two renaissance plays by thomas middleton on whom this title or subtitle the game of chess is actually drawn upon uh, a game at chess and women beware women now in middleton the game of chess was uh, very much like a sexual intrigue uh, the way in which a man tries to seduce a woman here we see that this expression a game of chess is mentioned in context of a couple who are pretty detached from each other and there is absolutely no physical connection between them this is a poem which connects nothing with nothing this is something which eliot actually says in the poem later and so this lack of connection this inability to communicate is set against this desperate need to communicate and when all communication fails well let's just have a game of chess and if you have already identified proof rock somewhere in this whole part congratulations that means you have already started to think the way eliot wants you to think if you have read proof rock then you would understand that this man to whom this woman is speaking is sitting there just like proof rock would have sat thinking about the ocean thinking about what is to be done thinking about rat sally and in his thoughts marvel's grand words become rattle of bones so this failure of grandeur this dystopic situation where all previous mythologies are subverted all previous grand narratives are broken down just like the grand blank verse is broken down to speech which actually fails to communicate isn't that a paradox isn't speech supposed to communicate stuff we'll get deeper into this and we'll continue our intellectual investigation into eliot's mind i don't know if that's even possible in our exploration of the third part of the wasteland which we promised to bring to you very very soon right after this so keep commenting stay subscribed and don't forget to press on that notification bell so that you get notified the moment the next video comes up
This is Poonami Mukherjee signing off. Thank you for being with us.